2 Kings chapter 21. Last week we finished up talking about King Hezekiah and uh, one of the one of the very very best kings that Judah had, a man of God, a man of prayer, uh, not a perfect man, but certainly uh, a man who wanted to do what was right and uh, a man who certainly honored God and who believed in God. And so uh, you remember that Hezekiah was told that he was going to die and he rolled over to the wall, he prayed and asked God for, uh, for more time, asked God not to, not to let him die. And Isaiah came back in and told him, the Lord's given you 15 more years. And in those 15 years, he had a son. And so you got a man of God, a man who loves the Lord, a man who's got a second lease on life, and now he has a son. And I wonder how he raised his son. I bet you he raised his son to love God. I bet you he raised his son to know God. I bet he taught his son as much as he could in those early years of his life. Manasseh is going to become king when he's 12, so Hezekiah didn't have a lot of time. But uh, I bet that every time he got a chance, he pointed that kid to the Lord. So let's pick up there in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 1. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years, one of the longest reigns of any king of Judah. David only reigned 40 years, so 55 years. In, in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he, by the way, ladies, that's a that's a good one right there. That would be awesome. Let's 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 go ahead and Roddy, Roddy Lena or Hephzibah. I told you, I told you, number eight would be Roddy. <laughs> Job also had a daughter named Jemima, and I've always gone for that one, but. I haven't got it done yet. But. Anyway, his mom's name was Hephzibah. So you had Hezekiah and Hephzibah. That's kind of a kind of a cool couple there. In verse 2, and he did that which was, what? Evil. Wait a minute. One of the most godly kings that we have, his kid is evil. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. You know, I love the way the Bible says that and points that out and reminds us of that. You know, these, these idolatrous practices of these people are the reason that God used the Israelites to cast them out. And yet the Israelites turned around then and worshipped those false gods that God had driven out. And, and it just shows the, the foolishness of this. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove, as did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So not only is he, is he worshipping Baal, but he's bringing pagan altars into the courts of the temple. And he, he says in verse 6, And he made his son pass through the fire. So he, he has a son, and he sacrifices his son to these pagan gods, and observed times, and used enchantments, and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 18 real quick. And... And we, what we have in Deuteronomy 18 is a list of stuff that God says, do not ever mess with. So Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Now here's the question that I have, that when I get to heaven I'm going to ask somebody. If Hezekiah had removed all those altars and the people had destroyed all those altars, they had cut down all those groves, they'd done away with all of that heathen practice, how did this young man learn about those things? Obviously, it went underground. And I think that's what Satanism always does. 
When it's acceptable, it comes crawling out, like right now in our world, in our culture. You can watch it. It's becoming more and more acceptable, and it comes out in your face, out in the open. But when it's when it's not acceptable, then it, it sneaks back into the darkness, but it's still there, and it had to have still been there. But God tells him, he says in verse 10, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. But that's what Manasseh did. Or that useth divination. But that's what Manasseh did. Or an observer of times. But that's what Manasseh did. Or an enchanter. Or a witch. Or a charmer. Or a consulter with familiar spirits. Or a wizard. Or a necromancer. And all of those are, are terms that uh, are talking about either communicating with demon spirits or maybe with the dead a necromancer is someone who claims they can can talk to the dead a wizard is someone who uses sorcery uh, a witch of course is the same thing but uh, you know and, and and here's what's here's what's funny Disney Disney always tries to do this right so does the Wizard of Oz you have the wicked witch but then you have the good witch Glinda and she's white and she's good, but she still uses magic. Well, there's no such thing as a good witch. I, I started to take a picture of it when we were in El Paso. Uh, there was a great big ad for a Kunandera. And uh, we, we stopped to get gas and we drove past it and I told Wendy, I said, oh, I wasn't fast enough. I gotta get a picture of that because it's this great big roadside ad called this number for Kunandera. Well, that's, that's a Mexican word for a witch. Uh, now they would call, the Kunandera is somebody that would help you, like a healer. But they're not a Christian. They're 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 doing, you know, mixing up something. But now they're gonna call a bad witch a bruja. That's a bad one. That's boom. Right? But God says, Don't don't mess with any of these things. Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And so that's what we see in Manasseh's life. He goes back and does all that stuff that God says don't do. And I don't know if he did it because he's rebelling against his father. And I don't know if he did it because he just thought there was no power with the Lord, but he could find this power through, through these means. I don't know what his reasons were, but he did much in the sight of the Lord to provoke, to provoke him to anger. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 6 and then it says in verse 7 and he set a graven image in the grove that he had made in the house so he's he's bringing idolatrous things into this grove in the house this is similar to what the antichrist is going to do he is going to set up the abomination that causes desolation now daniel told that told us that that would happen and we know that when antiochus <clears throat> excuse me, Epiphanes, the Syrian ruler, came into Israel. He did that. He actually slaughtered a hog on the altar and desecrated the altar. It caused a massive war to break out that the Jews eventually won. <clears throat> excuse me. But Antichrist is going to do the same thing. So, so Manasseh is, in a way, he is a type of the Antichrist. I mean, he, he's born into a kingly family. He walks in, he's 12 years old. They're gonna, he's going to become the king, and he is following on the heels of one of the most godly kings Judah's ever had. And he does some of the most horrendous things that we ever see. He says, he, he set a graven image in the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. So, so this is the covenant with Israel that's always conditional upon their obedience. If they disobey, God will punish them. If they obey, God will bless them. And here is Manasseh disobeying big time verse 9 but they hearkened not you see that they would not listen and it's a they it's not just Manasseh but it's the people as a whole 
they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them. So, so Manasseh, not only is he interested in these idolatrous practices, these occult practices, these uh, demonic practices, but he's seducing the people. So he has to, if you seduce somebody, you don't, you don't come straight on. You're not honest with them. You kind of you come in the side. You kind of trick them a little bit into thinking that, that your idea is good or, or whatever. And so, so he's like the Pied Piper leading the people away from God. Hezekiah walks in on his very first day and leads the people back to God. Manasseh is leading the people away from God. And it says uh, <clears throat> that he, uh, he seduced them, verse 9. And, but they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. You see that? The, the people of Judah were more evil than the Amorites or the Canaanites at this point. Now how sad is that? How, how tragic is that? Right? And he says, uh, uh, And the Lord spake, verse 10, by his servants the prophets, saying, So, so God's going to send prophets to him. So think back to Ahab. When Ahab was going astray up north in Israel, God sent prophets to him. He sent Elijah to him, right? And so God's going to do the same thing with Manasseh. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, uh, had done these abominations, and hath not, and had done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel: Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. <laughs> That's kind of a an interesting way to say that. Let's turn to Jeremiah and let's look at what one of those prophets actually had to say. So, Jeremiah chapter 15, <clears throat> verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, through Moses and Samuel stood, oh, sorry, though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And it shall come to pass if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? And thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and to destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? Now, Jeremiah is going to be after Manasseh, but the reason for the Babylonian captivity is Manasseh. He's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Okay? So this is a bad kid, all right? This is a bad kid. I mean, he's 12 years old. He gets to be the king, and he is exactly the opposite of his father. And so it says there in verse 12, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I'm bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. That's, that's quite a statement. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and the plummet of the house of Ahab. You know what a what a plummet is? It's a <clears throat> it's a uh, a plumb bob. So he says, I'm going to use the same line that I used in Samaria, and you use a plumb bob to get something perpendicular to the earth, straight up and down. You use a you use a, a level to get something level this way. You use a plumb bob to get something straight this way. And what he's saying is, is he's saying Judah's crooked. Samaria was crooked. I'm going to lay the plumb bob up against them and we'll see how straight they really are. So I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Now ladies, you should underline that because that says that men do the dishes. Did you see that? I'm helping you all that I can. Men are also supposed to make the coffee. It's biblical. 
It says he bruised, right? All right, so verse 14. And I will forsake the remnant of my... But by the way, what an image. What an incredible image. I am going to wipe you like I wipe a dirty dish. That's, what, that's the way God sees Judah. I'm going to take this dirty dish and I'm going to wipe it clean. That's what I'm going to do with this people. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. And so the entire history of the Israelite people is one of constant rebellion toward God. Verse 16, moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much. Now I don't know, I don't know exactly what kind of innocent blood that was, but a king is supposed to make sure that innocent blood is spared. A king is supposed to make sure that the wicked are punished, but the innocent are protected. And Manasseh did not do that. It says, Till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so, you read that, and you just want to spit. I mean, it just... It just leaves a bad taste in your mouth, you know? You're, you're like, man, Judah was doing so good. Samaria's already fallen to the Assyrians. God has spared Judah, and he's given them King Hezekiah. And he's not perfect, but boy, oh boy, has he ever done a great job of pointing the people back to the Lord, removing the idols from the land. Along comes Manasseh and sets them back, all the way back, farther than they, than they ever were from the very beginning. He's worse than the Canaanites. And you're like, oh, you, you rotten rascal. Now turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. What would you do with Manasseh? Well, you, you know, you'd kind of like to see him devoured by a tiger or something, right? I mean, he's a, he's a bad guy. Well, let's look in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 is the story of Manasseh again, and it's very similar to what we just read right up till verse 10. But when we get to verse 11, look what it says. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. So Manasseh actually gets abducted. He gets taken captive by Assyria. God permits this to happen. And they take him back to Babylon. And it says, And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. When he was taken captive, he began to seek for the Lord. And humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him. That means God listened to his prayer and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. That's what you call amazing grace. And this is why I serve God, because of his amazing grace. There is not a one of us that is right with God because of our own righteousness because of our good deeds. This is an incredible, awesome, this is one of the most awesome pictures of repentance that you can find. I mean, I mean, here's a guy who deserves nothing but God's judgment and wrath, and yet God chastens him, and he chastens him more so than any other king. No other king of Judah ever had something like this happen to him. And yet, when he throws him in that prison in Babylon, Manasseh comes to himself. And unfortunately, some people, this is what it takes. Some people have to just absolutely lose everything and get to the very bottom of the barrel before they will ever look up. But he does. And, and that's why you and I, we, we, if you, if you don't, don't ever, if you're going to err with God, err on the side of his grace. <laughs> because he's, I mean, remember, remember Ahab. We, we relate Manasseh to Ahab. Ahab was a rotten scoundrel, but he 
put on sackcloth. He tore his clothes. He, when he heard the judgment that was going to come, he cried out to God. And God said, look at that. Ahab is repenting. He's mourning for his sin. Okay, I won't do it in your life. I'll do it in your son's life. Right? God told Hezekiah the same thing. And, I, and, and this is one of the things that I have to wonder. Let's go back real quick and look at that. Back to 2 Kings. Let's go back to chapter 20. <clears throat> Verse 16. When Hezekiah was given the extra years of his life, it says, Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, that shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? See, I wonder if Manasseh wasn't bitter because God had prophesied that the bad thing was going to happen in his son's day. And Manasseh knew that. And he's like, whether I did anything good, bad, or otherwise, God's going to bring judgment in my days, so I'd just as well be a bad boy and live it up. I kind of wonder if that's what he did. Well, <clears throat> here's the thing. You don't ever want to do that. <laughs> because if you're going to err, err on the side of God's grace. Had Manasseh been a godly man and cried out to the Lord, I wonder if God might have said, all right, I'll spare you too, and I'll prolong that judgment. I'll prolong it some more. He sure might have. He'd done it in the past. And if you study God's track record, that's what that's why we have the Bible. If you study God's track record, one of the things you see is, is God recognizes repentance. And he even recognizes old Manasseh's repentance. And what an incredible you know, I mean it's just it's just unbelievable to think about the grace of God. Then after that, he's going to be released. He's going to come back. Look at verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 33. Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, even in the entering uh, in at the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel and raised it up very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. He completely made a 180 degree turn in his life, but it took him being thrown into prison in Babylon to do it. And so... You know, this is what happens, and sometimes we, we see this. This is what happens in a man's life who lives his life for the devil until late in life. And then he realizes, I'm not going anywhere. This isn't doing me any good. I'm, I'm in trouble, right? And he finally humbles himself. And it says that he humbled himself greatly. And he cried out to the Lord, and God heard him. And so that's why I, I put a couple of verses up here. Romans 10, 9. Now, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what Manasseh did. Not this part. He's not a new covenant. He doesn't know about Jesus. But he certainly came to a place where he cried out to God and he repented. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. No matter who you are, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, this is a new covenant verse. So Manasseh is not able to put his faith in Jesus because he doesn't know about Jesus. But he certainly can have repentance toward God, and that's what he did. So not only did he cry out to God, ask for God's forgiveness, God heard him, but when he released him, he came back and he cleaned up the mess that he made. So he goes to getting rid of all the idols. But it says, verse 17 of 2 Chronicles 33, Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, Yet unto the Lord their God only. So, so even though Manasseh had changed, he wasn't able to draw the people back. So the people that he seduced to go and do these things, when he turned around, he wasn't able to necessarily get all of them back. And I wonder how many of us have been bad examples in our younger years that we wish we could go back. Some of us have taught people to go away from God that once we turned around and we said, hey, let we... I, I messed up. That wasn't good. Let's let's go back to the Lord. And they're still, 
How sad is that? Here's one more, a couple of lessons, okay? <laughs> no, number one, God's grace is absolutely amazing, and it is not based on our righteous deeds. It is based on His righteousness. And so God looks for repentance. And even in the sorriest old boy like Manasseh, when someone comes to the place where they repent, God will see that. He will recognize that. He acknowledges that. Right? Another thing that's really important is, is Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So Manasseh spent his life sowing to the flesh. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He reaps the corruption of sowing to idolatry, sowing to his fleshly desires, sowing to the occult. And the corruption that comes of that is this defeat by the kings of Assyria being taken captive back to Babylon and then having to watch your nation that you led astray not necessarily come back to God when you do. But, he says, he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Just compare dad and son. Compare Hezekiah. Compare Manasseh. Both of them messed up. But Manasseh spent his whole life messing up <laughs> and then finally repented at the end. Hezekiah spends most of his life trying his best to serve the Lord, trusting the Lord, crying out to the Lord in, in, in times of need. And, and even, even then, he still, pride gets the better of him. And he does some dumb things by uh, showing off to the Babylonians. And it costs him. So they both reap to the flesh. But Manasseh's reaping is massive. And so here's the deal. God's grace is so amazing that you could literally live for the devil your whole life and on your deathbed repent and trust in Christ and you will be saved and you will go just you will you will be just as much in heaven as the person who got saved when they were five years old and followed Jesus every day of their life. And you've got to believe that. You need to know that. The deathbed confession is just as good as the kindergarten confession. However, the longer you spend sowing to the flesh, the more corruption you will reap. And not just you, but your family, your children, your loved ones, the people you work with, the damage that you do, the concentric circles. When you take a, a beautiful pond and you take a rock and you throw it out there into that, bam, and those ripples, they go. So you need to make ripples for Jesus like Hezekiah did, rather than making ripples for the devil like Manasseh did. Because those ripples, they're going to be made one way or the other. Let me show you one more thing. Let's go back to, to 2 Kings and let's turn over to chapter 24. I'm jumping ahead a little and we'll, we'll get to this here in a few weeks. But <clears throat> it says uh, <clears throat> in chapter 24, it's talking about a later king after Manasseh in his days Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years then he turned and rebelled against him excuse me and the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants the prophets surely at the the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight. Now, now remember, this is, this is in the days of Jehoiakim. Okay, so this is a later king. So Manasseh, and then his son, and then another, and then Jehoiakim, right? But why is it happening? Look at the last part of verse 3. For all the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Even though Manasseh repents, and even though he gets right with God, and even though I think we're going to meet him someday, <clears throat> the consequences of his actions literally outlive him. You know, I, I think about that sometimes when I watch our congressmen brag about some of the bills that they've gotten passed. And, and I, I wonder, you know, they make such a big deal about it, and they all take pictures while the president's signing those things into law, and, 
and they hand out pins and, and they, they post it on their website and they send out letters. We, we sponsored this, we got this done, you know. And then, and then you, you step back and you go, well, was that a righteous law? Because some of them have been. Some of them have been fantastic, good laws. But some of them have been horrible. And, and the, the, you know, the, the ripples from that rock that you threw into the water, just do 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 You know, the decisions that you and I make, whether we serve Jesus or whether we serve ourselves, or worse yet, like Manasseh, whether we serve Satan, <clears throat> those things have consequences. And it's not, it's not just us. It's not just consequences for us. It's consequences for all the people that we love, all the people that are around us. So I just want to encourage you tonight. Uh, man, God's grace is amazing. And it doesn't matter at what point you uh, realize who Jesus is and you repent. It, it'll work. Amen. Adrian Rogers says there's no one so bad they, need, uh, they can't be saved. And there's no one so good that they need not be saved. And that is so true. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how bad you are or how bad somebody is that you know. I used to pray for Osama bin Laden. Wouldn't it have been something if old Osama had gotten saved? Wouldn't it be something if Vladimir Putin got saved? I know he thinks he's a Christian, but he, they interviewed him. There ain't no way he's a Christian. Tucker asked him, he said, do you see evidence of God in the world around you? No. <laughs> well, that, that, one's, that one's gone. He's a cultural Christian at best. He has a, a brand of morality, and that's, that's good. That's okay. He's got an identity, a cultural identity. We're Orthodox, we're Russians, we, you know, this is our church. We're not Muslim, right? But he doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus that he entered into through repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you do that and someone asks you, do you see evidence of God around you? You say, yes. You say with Nicole C. Mullen, I spoke to him this morning, right? Uh, because everything in your life changes at that point. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the evening. Thank you for your word. It's absolutely incredible. Your grace overwhelms us. It amazes us. And we're so thankful, Lord. Grace that is greater than all our sin. And we thank you so much for it. God, help us to learn the lessons from your word and apply them to our life. And I pray for each and every one here, Lord, that you would just give wisdom and grace and blessing and and Lord, just, just let us know your presence each and every moment as we go and give us opportunities just to, to, uh, to live our life in a way that brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm glad you're here.